Welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with our guest, Scott Andrews from Investaquant. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer, the Capital Discussions is not a broker dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. So with that out of the way, uh, this is for educational purposes only. So I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and turn the presenter over to you, Scott. And uh, welcome. First time on the roundtable. We're, uh, we're glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, glad to be here. So you'll need to just share your screen again now. And the little button that allowed me to share before is no longer there. Well, let me see here. Should be, and gave you the presenter role. Can you go uh, Control Alt D like desktop? Me. I've got the panel up. Let me just, like I said, I'm not real familiar with WebEx. And that quick start tab or the share menu, either way you can get to it. All right, let's try this. Here we go. There we go. That's doing That's it. Sure. Yeah, I didn't get the little pop up box this time, but. I think we got it. All right, I see your screen. All right, let me uh, switch over to a little laser pointer here. I think it'll be a little bit easier to see for everyone. We'll get started. All right, well, all thank right. you uh, all for being here. Um, just by way of uh, introduction, uh, Brian Doyle is one of your uh, members, and he's actually one of our long term uh, members here at Investiquant. He was the one that introduced. Um, us to each other, and I uh, appreciate Brian doing that. Uh, he thought um, we would represent a good opportunity for your folks and uh, anyone listening to uh, learn a different technique and diversify uh, their trading, maybe better utilize their capital. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to be here. I am primarily a futures trader. Uh, the strategies I'll be showing today are uh, directional, if you will, or uh, short-term uh, oriented. Uh, a little bit different, certainly. I will not be talking about uh, gap uh, correction uh, option strategies per se, though uh, what I want to show you certainly could be utilized um, for uh, with options trading and whenever clients actually do you use option trades. Now, uh, I am primarily an intraday trader. Uh, Tom and I have spoken about um, Rob Hanna is one of our co-founders here. He is primarily a swing trader. He was not available today, uh, but perhaps he can come back and um, talk to you guys about timing the market some, using some of our research on a real short-term basis. And for us, a long trade is a number of days. So we're generally talking about intraday, overnight, and um, swing trading in terms of days, not even necessarily weeks. Anyhow, I'm delighted to be here, and I do appreciate the opportunity. Well, we're glad to have you here. All right. And if I can figure out how to make slides change on WebEx, we'll, we'll go to the next one. Well, it uh, should be your just PowerPoint. Like um, I usually use like the left and right arrow key. Yeah, that's what I normally do as well. And that does not work. Maybe, maybe because you have that pointer thing. Yeah, yeah that yeah. annotation. There we go. All right. No laser pointer there. Uh, I'm going to be showing uh, some statistics here. Uh, everything I do is quant-based, statistically oriented. Uh, I can't trade anything. It's just the way I'm wired, if you will, with my um, without seeing a historical um, affirmation, if you will, that the technique or approach I'm using has made money historically, period. It's just the way I'm wired, and a lot of your folks are probably wired the same way, uh, understanding a little bit about the way you guys are trading um, 
uh, options. So uh, do use this information at your own risk. Uh, I've personally conducted the research numbers I'll be sharing with folks here. Uh, certainly no guarantee that uh, they're accurate, um, but I believe they are, and certainly they're going to be useful directionally to help the people better understand some intraday uh, trading techniques. Uh, for, because I'm sharing some statistics, um, some of these are going to be a little bit uh, uh, like an eye chart. So if you want to download these, I suggest you go to investorquant.com uh, forward slash capital discussions, and you can download the slides. You can also download a copy of my book. Um, and really, uh, if you're really a nuts and bolts kind of person, you understand how things work, the ebook here is a great way to learn more about what I'll be showing today, which is really just one technique. Um, Brian suggested I show you guys more of our tools uh, and our platform and so on. I just didn't feel like it was appropriate to make a commercial about what we do, but rather to educate a little bit more about why we do what we do, why I trade the way I trade, and why uh, hundreds of folks around the world who, who subscribe to our services do the same. So I'll be talking about the gap, and if you want to dig in more, you can download the book uh, right there. So uh, as I mentioned, IQ can help you. Best quant, we uh, you hear me call it IQ, can help you better utilize your existing capital, help you diversify your returns, and better time your option trades Entries and exits. Now, I'm going to be, again, focusing on intraday trading strategies, uh, specifically the gap, the opening gap, which is obviously at the open is a great time uh, to either get in or get out of uh, a technique or a trade that you may be in. So gap information I'll be sharing can help you, as well as some of the swing trading research we have on our website that uh, I will not be discussing, but perhaps, again, Rob could talk about later. Uh, I do welcome uh, questions. Um, so, in fact, Tom, can you just post, just to make sure I'm not goofed up here any further, I know I've been off to a rough start, can you just send a chat message or someone uh, send a message so I can make sure I can see any questions? Ah, there we sure, go. Sure, there we go. Yep, great. So, uh, I welcome questions if you want to ask as we go along relating to a slide that I'm on, otherwise you can hold them to the end, and um, um, whichever you prefer is absolutely fine. I like questions. Makes it a little bit more interesting instead of just here, making it a one-way conversation here. Um, I'm going to focus the bulk of the presentation is going to be on understanding the technique itself that I'm trading. Because, again, this is a very different way of trading than what most of uh, you folks are doing. And uh, that's good. That's not bad. That uh, means that we could, again, indeed help you from a diversification point of view and give you a different way to leverage the margin in your account and uh, turn your capital. So once you understand the, the technique, which we call fading the gap, then uh, we'll talk about some gap trading uh, statistics that drive my decision making. I'll actually explain my exact logic for how I select trades and uh, show you how you can learn a little bit more if interested. So this slide, I'm going to warn you right now, is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. This is not meant to be um, anything but uh, sort of a lighthearted introduction. I take this very seriously in what I do. And uh, but as I like to tell people, all of these things, um, you know, you may think give you a real reason to listen to me, but it doesn't mean I know anything about trading, honestly. Um, even teaching thousands of other traders doesn't mean I necessarily know how to uh, to trade and make money in the markets. Um, I know some of you, if you've been around a while, which I believe many of you have been, it's you should be cynical. There are a lot of folks out there that are teaching stuff that just doesn't work. Um, so. Be careful, and uh, the only thing that really matters in anyone's resume is do they know how to make money uh, in the markets, not even the fact they've made a bunch of trades. So I don't present this necessarily to brag uh, at all. There's certainly plenty that have more impressive and smoother equity curves historically, but it does show all of my futures trades using the techniques I'll be showing you um, here today uh, on the, in the opening gap since 2007. Um, over 2,000 trades here. The majority of them were opening gap trades, probably more than 95, 90% of them, I'd guess, um, since 2007. That's when I started a, a small blog, and it just sort of took off. I just shared my research and my target and my stop each day before the open, and um, it just sort of took off from there. So as I like to tell people, don't focus on uh, the slope as much uh, from left, bottom left to top right, but more from the peaks to the drawdowns. The, um, that's really where you're making money as a trader, right? When you go through those tough periods that are down or sideways, 
and um, that's where I've learned the most. I've slowly gotten better over the years, and there's all kinds of other caveats and considerations here in this equity curve, but uh, the key thing is um, I've been through a lot through a wide range of market conditions, and uh, I'm going to share the basics of what's helped me survive and thrive uh, during all types of conditions. So let's get into the opening gap. So there are a lot of different ways to define what a gap is. I simply define it as the difference between where a market opens versus its prior day closing price. And that shows up visually on your chart as a gap, right, a space. So I don't necessarily concern myself with whether or not it's opening beyond the prior day's range or not. Now this is a five minute chart. These are not daily bars. It's a five minute intraday chart going back to March 2nd here. And uh, you can see this particular day, the EM closed around 1978. And the next morning, it opens up around 1970, 1971. So about an eight point gap in the S&P futures market. And uh, let's see, that translates to about 80 cents in the spider, if that helps you in terms of translating or interpreting this information. And you can see the intraday price action uh, was fairly volatile, actually very volatile. It ultimately did retrace back to the prior day's close, thereby filling the gap. So the technique that uh, I've used for years, and I just stumbled on it uh, through my own research, uh, is called fading the opening gap. That means I will short if the gap is up, or I will buy if the gap is down, meaning if the 9.30 a.m., Eastern time opening price, that's when the New York Stock Exchange opens, that's I'm looking to short or buy based on that overnight movement. And I'm generally targeting the prior day's close, which depending upon the instruments, either going to be around 4 o'clock Eastern or 4.15 in the futures, which is again what I trade. And I'm closing it at the end of the day if neither my stop nor my intraday target is hit. I'm not taking overnight exposure, if you will. And I do have strategies that will but for my intraday strategies, um, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the retail trader to take advantage of um, price action and uh, profit from them. So uh, here's an example. Uh, now, unfortunately, they don't all look quite this good, but this is exactly the kind of scenario I'm looking for and pretty typical of a, a lot of my trades where you'll have a gap down. It looks a little bit scary. Um, for whatever reason, it could have been any number of events that caused that gap to occur a price will retrace back to that prior day's closing level, which in this case was around that 1852 level there. So fading the gap, if the gap is down, a buy. If the gap is up, a short. Any questions on the basics? Because if, if, if you're confused or any of this, I know the terminology is a little bit different, a little bit apples and oranges with what what some of you may be used to. Uh, now's the time to speak up because I'm going to get into the statistics and the statistics will lose you completely um, if you're not, um, it's not clear to you what a gap fade is. No questions. All right. Oh, Ian says to use a stop loss. Yes, and I will be getting to that um, and I'll show you the, the statistics on so what's worked historically uh, the best and talk through that. Uh, another question is, how do you sit through a 10-point drop before it fills? Well, I probably wouldn't. Um, I'd probably be stopped out by that point. So it just depends. Um, obviously, I'm trying to trade the gaps that don't take any heat or adverse excursions. So I want them all to look like this, right? Um, certainly. Probably about half of them do that. The other half takes some adverse excursion before retracing uh, and filling. And I don't know that the gaps drop has ended in reverses. Uh, I don't know. Uh, again, I'm using historical edges, and I'm going to take you through that process. So I think these um, these are great questions, and I appreciate it. Will make more sense when I get uh, to the end. So I'll show you how I select which ones have the best chance of retracing from their open back to the prior day close. All right, so uh, first and foremost, what a lot of people don't realize is that opening gap fades uh, actually have an inherent bias. Uh, about 90% of all opening gaps are large enough to trade. About two-thirds of all opening gaps 
and the equity markets will fill the same day. So any um, market, not just the U.S. markets, but uh, the global markets uh, like over in Europe, FTSE, uh, Eurostox, DAX, and so on, and even uh, Nikkei and other indices around the world tend to have a mean reverting bias for a number of reasons. But um, it's the opening gap that's created by whether it be um, earnings announcements, geopolitical events, uh, economic announcements like um, GDP reports, monthly jobs report, so on, will cause the futures markets in those countries and those indices to move away from the prior, prior close. Big money doesn't want to chase, even if the news is legitimate. Uh, let's say it was a much better than expected monthly jobs report, uh, like we recently had. Then um, that news often will not be good enough to sustain price action, and prices will revert back to the prior day close, filling that gap before big money may power right back in and take it in the original direction of the gap. So a lot of folks think of uh, opening hour is um, – Amateur hour in the markets, there's probably some truth to that. Um, I like to think of myself as um, not necessarily taking advantage of the amateurs, but taking advantage of um, the folks that are less sensitive to their timing of their entries or exits. and are just getting out of the open because they're maybe getting in or getting out of a longer-term trade without much regard to uh, whether or not the market's going to rally you know, you know, half a percent or a quarter of a percent, or sell off a quarter of a percent um, intraday. So I'm taking advantage of those anomalies that can statistically be measured and identified. So let's get into uh, some statistics here. Uh, yes, and um, Brian's commenting. Uh, thank you, Brian. Brian's commenting. I don't trade every gap every day by any means. I'm highly selective. So there are 252 trading days a year. I primarily focus on the S&P futures, the NASDAQ futures, and the Russell futures. And probably on average, I've got at least one trade occurring in one of those markets three or four days a week. But in any given market, I may only trade it once or twice per week, depending upon how it has set up. It's all about selection. Uh, and I see a couple people are trying to um, slide, uh, get the download. Go to uh, invest to quant slash capital discussions. Uh, it's at the bottom right here. And then after you enter your name and email, it will immediately give you a um, – the page that pops up. You can download the slides uh, or the book immediately. And if not, just email me. In fact, let me just send you my email if you have any problems. Take care of you. Well, let's keep moving. All right, so opening gap fades, shorting up gaps, and this assumes hypothetically you shorted every opening gap that's occurred in the past 10 years, and you see the breakdown by years, or you bought every down gap. So you faded every opening gap over the past 10 years. You can see that the number of tradable gaps, a little bit less than that 252 trading days per year, because about 10% of them are just too small. In fact, today was an example of that. We had a nominal gap, only about a point in the ES or 10 cents in the spider, and uh, that was uh, inside of my minimum gap size to make it worth the, my time and uh, risk of capital. But on average, about 90% of them are tradable, and you can see the historical win rate. Now, win rate's a little bit um, hypothetical here, right? It's just simply assuming you fade the open, you target the prior day's close, and you exit at the end of the day if it didn't make it to the prior day close. And for all intents and purposes, this represents the percentage of opening gaps that generally fill the same day they're created. So again, showing off a very clear and consistent mean reverting bias, all of that around that 68% um, average gap fill um, rate per day. So they have an inherent bias. That gives me confidence, allows me to trade even the scariest-looking opening gaps, knowing that the majority of the time, whatever caused that gap is not going to be strong enough to sustain it right off the open. And in fact, big money may actually, big money being like institutions and hedge funds and so on, they may actually want to push it back to the prior day close before um, establishing their, their longer-term position. 
and uh, we'll get to selection. I see some great questions um, with uh, a number of questions on selection. I'll get to those more. Do you trade size with this? Size is a relative thing to everyone, Carlos, but yes, um, I and many of our clients are trading uh, significant um, account sizes. Now, we're trading futures contracts, uh, which have inherent leverage, which is a great thing. That's not a bad thing. It's a great thing when you have an edge. Um, but we've got, the um, last survey I did, 18% of our clients have seven-figure accounts uh, that they're trading and using to trade um, these types of intraday strategies. Our typical client, if there's such a thing, because it goes all the way down to thirty to fifty thousand dollar accounts as well. Uh, typical client probably has about one hundred fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollar account that they're using. So let's talk, let's talk about stops and targets. So what's the optimal target? Well, for me, it actually uh, I prefer to target gap fill or some point beyond. So this simply shows the historical odds for targeting a gap um, at the gap fill level or 100% of gap size. And you can see 68% of those will retrace back to the prior day close. But you can see a significant percentage of those will go beyond gap fill, you know, 125, 150% the size of the gap. But the real point I want to make here is a lot of folks like to target the midpoint. So if you're an intraday trader or you may have heard another educator talk about, they like to target the halfway point. Yeah, they're about 80% of the time you'll retrace back to the prior day close, and that's good. But the point I want to make is that the overwhelming majority of those, which is about 85% of them, will actually go all the way to gap fill. So don't cut yourself short. Cut your winner short when you're in a winning trade that's already made it halfway towards gap fill. Go ahead and hold at least some of the position, if not all the position, for full gap fill. And that's generally what I do, if not some point beyond. So what's the optimal size? A little bit of an eye chart here, but you can use points if you're trading futures or dollars if you're trading like ETFs, like the spider or the Qs. Um, you can use percent of gap size. You can use percent of the five-day average true range. That's a volatility measure. Uh, any number of ways to actually set your position size. And we're trying to reduce our risk or exposure since we are trading leveraged instruments, futures. Um, so. The key thing here is that a lot of folks think, well, geez, with a 65 or a 70% win rate, then, man, this will be pretty easy to make money. I just need to eliminate those big losing days by uh, having an intraday stop. And unfortunately, it's not that easy. So if you've been around a while, I'm sure this doesn't surprise you, but um, markets are way too efficient and to simply use some stop and trade all of them, expect to make money. In fact, profit factor, if if you're not familiar with the term, is a ratio of historical profits to historical losses. Anything around one is break even, or any, um, and you can see it doesn't matter whether you use a tight stop or a large stop. Um, the, while the win loss ratio changes, the profit factor doesn't. They all are right around one, period. So this is not a game of using stops. I like to sort of say stops are overrated. Uh, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. And we'll get to gap size questions in our uh, selection in a moment. So in general, I like to use bigger stops, not smaller ones. Uh, I routinely, and this is a, a probably for some of you that are trading income and high probability um, uh, option strategies, this won't be uncomfortable for you. But for a lot of traders, what I'm about to say is uncomfortable. It's not for me and certainly not for our clients. I use stops that are on average bigger, meaning I'm risking more than I stand to make. So I'm, by doing so, I'm allowed. Uh, it gives me or provides, enables a very high win rate strategy. Generally, 65% for me historically has been my average win rate. Um, but when I'm wrong, I lose a little bit more. So it varies year to year, but my average uh, win size is anywhere from 70 to 90% of my average stop size. And I tend to be right about or have profitable trades about 65% of the time. I do that using a stop that's just a a comfortable number for me that allows me to back into my desired win rate of 30% of the five-day average true range. So just looking at the the average range between the high and the low of the past five days and take 30% of that, and that works for most markets. I'm using true range, by the way, not absolute. 
uh, range. True range is, is inclusive of opening gaps. Um, and for targets, I generally target the prior close at some point beyond. So bottom line is there's no right or wrong. You can back into your desired win rate and you can make money risking a lot less than you're targeting on average or risking a lot more than you're targeting on average. It's just a matter of what works best for you. And for me, I would rather um, have a high win rate. It allows me to stick with my strategy when um, I'm going through tough times, meaning if I get stopped out two or three times, I can deal with that psychologically. I struggle with getting stopped out, or would struggle, I know, because it's never happened, um, knock on wood. If I got stopped out seven times in a row, that would really be tough for me psychologically, no matter how much confidence I had in my research and my data. I just haven't found many people that can stick with a strategy that um, is getting stopped out seven or eight times in a row. Now, why would that happen? Well, if you're risking a little bit and trying to make a, a lot, then you're by definition going to get stopped out more. The volatility, the chop post open is going to stop you out more, and uh, that'll weigh on you. If you just consider the probabilistic odds of getting into seven consecutive or eight consecutive losses over, say, 100 trades in the course of a year, it's almost guaranteed to happen if you're trading a strategy that has 30 or 40 percent odds of a winner. So, again, I like to use 60, 70 percent. Um, win rate strategies, and that allows me to go throughout most years without having any more than three or four consecutive losses in a row. I've had, um, in 10, 12 years of doing this, I've had more than five or more losses occur about every other year. So I can handle that. Frustrating, but I can I can handle that psychologically without overriding my strategy, without second-guessing myself, without tweaking my stops and targets and so on. Uh, question, how much, uh, and again, I'm going to come back to some of these questions, and if I miss your question, I am not one of those people that ever skips a question. Um, if I miss it, just reference it, and I'll go back to it or repost it. Uh, but I am passing over some of these that uh, I know I'm going to cover later in the presentation. But there's a question uh, from Arstall. Have you tested how much of the ATR daily, daily ATR occurs in the first hour? Yeah, that varies, um, obviously, by day and market condition um, a lot, quite frankly. So off the top of my head, I really don't know that number. Uh, if I had a guess, first hour ATR is 30 to 50% of most days. That's a good question. I, I should probably know that I don't. Uh, but I can tell you if, if, if um, perhaps in this is where you were going with your question, on the average with a 30% stop, 30% of the five-day average true range, I am um, either hitting my target or being stopped out uh, on average around um, an hour to an hour and a half after I enter the strategy. So typical trade holding period for me is, believe it or not, less than an hour and a half. Uh, that said, there are some days that it doesn't hit my stop or target and I sit on the position all day and close it out at the end of the day. Good question though. Okay. Yeah, Linda's fantastic. Uh, I am an admirer of hers. Uh, used to be 40%, now it's close to 60%. You yeah, have to be careful using absolutes like that. Um, it really varies by market condition. That number, if I showed you, I'm positive if I checked it every day for this year, it would, um, if you looked at it by week or month, it would vary quite a bit. Anyhow, interesting thought though. All right, so how do I select these gap trades? Well, there's several things that I consider on every gap trade before I place a trade. First and foremost is size, just like you guys suggested or a couple of people posted. Size does matter, right? So um, it's the smaller gaps as a percentage of the five-day ATR that have the highest probability of filling. So again, I'm very win rate sensitive. And you can see also, a little bit counterintuitively, but using um, and end, even an end-of-day stop has actually shown the most profitable scenario to be those gaps between 20 and 40 percent of the ATR. So with the current um, five-day average to range in the ES, you know, that's like two to four points, which is a real narrow range, two to four point gaps. Um, that you know We've had some pretty good volatility this year, actually very good, and their five-day ATR has been 20, 30, 40 points even, I think, at one point. So um, that number obviously is a relative thing, but that's sort of the sweet spot. So a small gap 
less than 40% of the 5 DATR. This is a good nugget to take away. Uh, in general, it would be considered what I and many others call a common gap. And that means it's more likely to revert back to the prior day's close. If it's more than 40%, you can see that the probability is less than one. A profit factor less than one means it's lost money most of the time. That means those gaps are more likely to keep running in the direction of the gap. So your takeaway is a, um, a bullet point here for you to remember is, hey, larger gaps more likely to keep going in the direction of the gap, um, at least 50% chance um, in general, than to revert. If it's less than that, more likely to go back to the prior day's close. I mentioned I missed another comment earlier. Um, said I get chopped every time my stop is too close. That's absolutely right. You have to give us a, a, use a large enough stop to get away from the post-open volatility because no one can predict what's going to happen in the minutes, you know, immediately following the open. You just can't. Believe me, I spent a lot of I spent, I spent a lot of calories over my life uh, trying to solve that, and it's something I continue to pursue, and our team continues to work on, and we get a little bit better um, each year. But um, no one can predict what's going to happen, and, and actually, it, what happens year to year even um, varies significantly by the market conditions that are in play. So this was a little bit more of a complicated um, concept for someone to grasp. To me, it's fairly straightforward, uh, but let me not trying to talk down to anyone, but let me just lay it out for people that may not be familiar with a typical Japanese candlestick. I like to use a daily Japanese candlestick to create potential opening zones. So I segment the prior day's action based upon the high, the close, the open, and the low. So those four key levels create five zones. I have my own nomenclature, and it's defined here. You don't even have to worry about it. The key thing is a gap that opens above the prior day's highs, if the day was a green candlestick, green candlestick is simply open, has a close above its open, 61% uh, historical win rate in over two years, 10 years. If it opens between the high and the close, like we had in some of the markets today, 80%. In fact, I um, uh, had some mechanical systems, automated systems that traded today. These were high probability setups. Uh, though they were small, depends on the market, uh, they're very high probability when they trigger that area, and I took them and made a little bit of money. Um, gapping down, also very high probability, but to get more towards the extremes, the win rates go down, I generally leave them alone. Now, the flip side of this of a green candlestick would be a red candlestick, a, a daily bar that closed below its open, um, independent of whether or not the close was higher or lower, by the way. I'm just looking at the, the color of the candlestick. The relative position that close to the open at those four key levels creates basically sister um, numbers just in the inverse. So those four levels create five zones. The two different colors of the candlestick creates um, double that zone. So I actually have 10 different zones that I've studied for years. Um, and quite frankly, it's the zones that sort of got me on the map and got established me with a fairly large following of um, hardcore system testers and traders uh, because they work. Not, no one had really broken the zones down the way that I've done it, I guess, at least not shared it publicly. And uh, this was a huge breakthrough for, for me personally. And many of my strategies um, consider, at least in part, the opening zone before I pull the trigger. So another consideration, uh, day of the week matters uh, a lot, a lot more than people realize. This is looking for the past 10 years. Um, these numbers do change. I will say that a little bit, um, depending on what's going on. The key thing I tell everyone to keep in mind is uh, don't get too excited about, hey, you want to buy every down gap on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and so on. It's just a slight buy. It's just one consideration. The key thing here is look at this. Mondays, probably should have circled this. Mondays are the riskiest day to fade the gap, only a 65% win rate. Whereas as you get later into the week, the numbers improve. So in general, gap fading works better the second half of the week, and it's better than it does the first half of the week. And there's a delineation between shorts and longs as well. So how do you make money, Scott? Right, That's what we're trying to figure out here. Well, it's all about the market conditions. So 
you just can't use day of week, you can't use gap size, can't use zone, or I guess you can, but you'll be disappointed. Your edge will be too small um, to really make it worth your while, in my opinion, even using the, the attractive leverage that features provide. Um, trading options, you, know, you got to deal with slippage and decay and all, even intraday, you're not going to have a lot of decay, but um, there's a little bit of um, uh, spread there, right? So um, the key here is to choose the right gaps and market condition is the key for me. So uh, I, you can define market conditions any number of ways. There are some ways of doing it that are better than others. My real s secret sauce in, in choosing market conditions though is the fact that I look at multiple ways of assessing or defining the current market environment. I'm looking at trend, I'm looking at momentum, volatility, you know, common concepts here, overbought, oversold, seasonality. A lot of different ways you can define these, by the way. I may or may not have the best way of defining these, and it doesn't matter. You know, I share the concept here, but the key thing here is I look at how a strat how a setup, a technique has performed historically based on the current state of its trend as I define it, its momentum, its volatility, overbought, oversold, and seasonality. Uh, some simple concepts I like to look at on trend. Um, where are we relative to the recent highs and lows over a period of time? I like to look at momentum in terms of sort of persistency um, and strength of the recent move. Uh, so a, a different variation. You could even argue of trend, but um, um, very different in many ways. Volatility, uh, ATR is one way of doing a lot of ways to measure volatility, VIX and so on. Overbought, oversold, I'm using um, Bollinger Bands and Bollinger Bands. Um, you know, how stretched are we relative to the mean? Um, and then I do use um, calendar considerations like day of week, part of month, um, and so on. And when you take those concepts and look at them in the context of the opening gap size and gap zone, now you're really getting to a level where you've got a very accurate historical view, an apples to apples comparison of what's happened um, over X number of years in trades historically. And that can give you conviction, that can give you a statistical edge. That's what I've done for years, and that's, in fact, this is how I trade um, and what our clients do as well. So just for example, and I wish it were simpler, I wish you could just look at gap size and zone and be done with it. You can't. If you don't look at market conditions, you're just going to be on the wrong side of too many trades. So here's a real simple example. What if you historically, hypothetically shorted all large up gaps, those greater than 40%? We already know those are 50% winners, um, but you can make some good money on them, some excellent money on them in the right conditions. You can also lose a lot of money. So simply using a simple study called a 10-day um, high, right? Putting in a 10-day high close makes or not the a 10-day low can make a huge difference in the historical win rate as well as the profitability. So context, specifically market conditions, matter. Now, a question uh, from Carlos, do your rules apply to earnings gaps? Um, yes and no, and I'll say it this way. I do not, and someone else asked about selection. I am not, uh, I used to do this, but I found it was not a great return on my time. I am not spending any time personally anymore than many of our clients use our platform to do this, studying um, and picking stocks that are set up best for trading the gap. Um, I think stocks are okay for trading gaps. Um, they're great for momentum and breakouts and following the gap. Um, the majority of stocks on any given day will fade because they're correlated with their corresponding e uh, ETFs and indices, right? Like the S&P, Dow 30, NASDAQ 100, and so on. Um, but I found myself spending too much time trying to pick the right stock. Um, they're going to correlate with the indices, so I prefer just to use the clean efficiency of the futures markets applied towards um, or using the indices themselves. So uh, as it relates to earnings, um, I don't know that I would want to trade a gap that's based, uh, that's tr trading on earnings uh, that day using just statistical analysis. Though I will say, guess what, on earnings, my guess is earnings day, if it's the announcement's pre-market or the close of the prior day, more likely to have um, a sizable gap or a small gap. And if it's a small gap, it's probably indicative of 
it wasn't a shocker and it's probably going to revert back to the prior day close. So good question. Though. Thank you. So um, if you start thinking about the number of permutations uh, that could be applied of looking at 10 different zones and four different gap sizes, because um, I talked about gap size, gapping up or down, large or small, um, in looking at five different market, many different states of five different market conditions, it becomes hundreds, actually I think it's thousands of permutations. Um, and you start considering different stop sizes and different targets. Um, there, there are not infinite, but tens of thousands of permutations. So it became too much for me to keep track of. And so I uh, started working with a programmer years ago who started building a database, close friend who actually helped me start a prior company of mine. Um, that we were fortunate enough to take public, um, we just turned it into a real database-driven thing. So now all of my data is presented um, and calculated in the evening so I can be prepared the next morning at a glance. And this is an example of one opening area, a small up gap opening. Uh, this is back in day before tax day uh, in April. Uh, this particular day was a small up gap, and it showed if the ES opened between 2076 and 20. 86 that day, historically under similar market conditions, small up gaps had retraced back to the prior day close about 70% of the time uh, and had made a bunch more in profits and losses. Uh, that's what the 1.76 profit factor means. It means it made, roughly speaking, 75% more profits than losses. That is a compelling setup. In fact, four of the five systems that I just mentioned had showed strong profitability, and that's why they're color-coded green, and one was slightly profitable historically. I'm going to trade those setups every single time with the greatest discipline, the greatest um, efficiency, the greatest leverage, everything I can as perfectly as I can. That's all I do. Every day, I'm looking for these types of opportunities. Now, again, I'm not scouring. Uh, we've got about 100 S&P stocks, and uh, uh, in terms of the biggest volume, of liquid ones in the uh, Q's 100 as well, about 200 stocks and 50 to 75 ETFs that we share, we create this data each day as well. That's not my style to sit there and try to find the best one. I just like to uh, trade the indices primarily. It's just a lot easier, but certainly you could do that, and a lot of our folks do that uh, as well. So what's my secret sauce? In a nutshell, I'll take all these different concepts I've mentioned here and I look at them with a robust um, market adapting and performance adapting database. I haven't talked about that. I think it's a little bit confusing for folks. But essentially, uh, there's some pitfalls of creating um, pattern-based systems and price-based systems that, quite frankly, kill most systems' performance over the long term. They don't, they don't um, update dynamically to current market conditions. Uh, mine do. Every day we take, or ours do, every day we update. Uh, multiple times per day, at least once per day, and sometimes multiple times per day with current market conditions, and they self-adapt to their own performance. When my rules I'm for a, my rules are performance-based, by the way, they're not any combination of patterns. I don't care what combinations of market conditions and patterns and size and system are generating a strategy on a given day anymore, because I really realize all that matters is has it made money historically. So by um, only taking a certain minimum or accepting a certain minimum win rate and profitability, I'm able to only trade trades that historically over the past 10 years have shown to have a real edge. And that's what I do. So I'm self-adapting. When an edge stops working for whatever reason, sometimes they do, no big deal. My strategy stops taking those trades. So that's how I create a positive trade experience every time um, I trade. I, the majority of the 2,000 plus trades I showed you were executed manually over the past uh, nine years since I became an educator and over the course of my career as a trader. Uh, over the past year, though, I've done almost exclusively automated trading. So I've taken my algorithms and automated them. Now, this whole process is called ensemble forecasting, by the way. I'm not making that up. Uh, we've had Duke University's uh, Center for Quantitative Modeling. Uh, validate our methodology, actually help us um, identify the, the optimal combinations and performance criteria for our systems. And um, it's powerful. It it works. doesn't work every time. Um, like I mentioned before, my average historical win rate 
uh, is only about 65% white. 65%, but that is more than sufficient to generate a very positive trade expectancy uh, for every trade. So uh, my results here today, I've got a tracking account. It's actually an IRA uh, that I trade with nominal leverage, only one contract for every 10,000 um, that, that I'm trading. Uh, it's generated about 15,000 in profits. Uh, you can uh, leverage these up more um, or less if you want to be even more conservative. Uh, 235 trades, uh, that's taking actually all of our strategies. Uh, that are trading the gap. So I've got eight gap trading strategies. They're all somewhat correlated. They have different versions. Some of them work better than others. You can actually see it on our website. Um, but I track everything just to make sure that uh, I'm aware of what's working and what's not and so on. Most of our clients don't trade them all. In fact, I wouldn't recommend you trade them all. You don't need them all. Um, trade some of the stronger ones. You can see which ones are clearly stronger, the ones that have the stronger historical equity curves on our website. Uh, but the key thing is uh, even trading the, the all of my strategies equally with equal trade sizes, trading the good, the bad, and the other ones even. Not, they've all, they haven't all worked this year. Most of them have. Um, it's had a very nice expectancy per 10,000 traded. So um, before I open it up to further questions, uh, if you want to learn more, um, Brian, again, has, has it suggested I really dig into the platform and our tools and techniques. It's just I didn't want to make it a commercial, and it's too much to get into. And frankly, we've got two types of, of um, clients that utilize us. Uh, we're mostly utilized by traders, though increasingly what I would call active investors are using us. Um, some of you probably consider yourself more of an active investor that's using different techniques for generating income or returns in your accounts. Um, some of you consider yourself traders. If you're a trader and you want to dig in and, and manually execute these trades, by the way, all of our strategies, the, even um, the automated ones, we generate alerts that can be manually executed for our clients. So you don't have to use auto trading. Um, our auto trading can be done for you in your account, or you can use one of our um, auto trading apps like NinjaTrader or TradeStation. Or again, you can use any broker platform, manually execute the trades using alerts. Um, anyhow, we're going to do two webinars. One for what I would orient more towards traders. If you think of yourself as a trader and you want to see the ins and outs, the nuts and bolts, and you want to dig into um, all this a lot more, and you've made it this far in our presentation, then you probably uh, want to learn more about our platform and uh, manually executing trades using our different edges. Um, and again, this is in the coming, uh, this presentation 23rd will be a little bit more intraday oriented, because again, I'll let Rob, our other co-founder, focus more on overnight and swing uh, strategies. If, on the other hand, you say, Scott, man, that's interesting, but a little bit over my head or a little bit more intense than I want because I'm a part-time trader or what have you and I'm just looking to diversify, then you probably want to show up for the webinar that will be uh, uh, a little bit after that. We're still working on the times. I think it's going to be in the evening, actually, for uh, that will auto-trade your account. We call it our white glove service. Take the exact strategies I'm trading, and they're auto-traded in your account. So, um Anyhow, uh, if you sign up for the book and the slides, we'll send you information and details on those webinars. I'm not, don't think they've set up to um, register directly quite yet. Um, yeah, appreciate that, Michael. I want to be uh, fair to Tom um, in terms of not turning this into a sales presentation. It's not my style, anyhow. I believe, you know. There's no special offer. I think you hear just about any other offer educator out there. They're going to give you some special offer and try to hard sell you today or by end of the week. But in a nutshell, you can license the platform. Uh, the entire platform is about 2,500 bucks uh, per year, or about $200 a month. Um, if you want to just license individual strategies, you can do that, and they vary from 600 to 1,200 dollars um, a year, which is all. A, huge discount off of their average returns. But I like to think of it as a premium service um, for folks. And, uh, you know, we're real. We're mostly traders. We're not quite 10, 10 employees, and we have six traders uh, that have been trading for many, many years. Um, and this is what we do. We use everything we show on that site. Uh, all of our strategies, we're trading ourselves with our own capital and normally pretty significant capital of that.
And I also saw you had a, a military discount, too. I'm a former Air Force pilot, so that, was, that caught my attention. I'm sorry, Tom. I forgot to mention that only applies to uh, Army veterans. Oh, rats. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for Air Force, since the Air Force started as part of the Army Air Corps, uh, we'll extend it to Air Force folks. The Navy guys and the Marines, that's a little tougher for me to swallow. I'm teasing. Well, they have airplanes too, so. <laughs> yeah, they do. And I was actually in the Navy. I was a uh, helicopter pilot in the Army. But, um, you know, we do have a, a 15% discount for all military veterans. Just shoot me a note, and I'll send you a coupon that works on everything we sell, 15% right off the top. Uh, let's see. Any arrangement with brokers to use this platform free or with a discount? Um, yes, so uh, TradeStation or, uh, is one of our partners. They will allow you to get a rebate, a significant rebate. I think it's 20% off your commissions until you've recouped the full cost of, uh, that you invested with us. That's a great deal. So um, you can email me and I can put you in touch with them as well. Uh, let's see. Kirk, this is, I get the fade idea and... Um, what book or webinar do you specify your market condition criteria? Yeah, the book is, is extremely basic. It builds upon what I showed here, but it doesn't get into uh, – I first wrote the book back in 2008 to explain the basics of trading the gap and address all the questions I was getting. It's only about 60 pages ebook. Um, market condition criteria, uh, we have more detail on our website. We don't get into the exact details. That's a little bit of our secret sauce, I guess. Um, the concepts that I showed uh, in this slide explain the big picture, um, and I know that's not a great answer for a lot of people, but put yourself in our shoes. We wouldn't share everything uh, that we do, um, but here's, an, here's the good news. Um, the concepts we're using are all basic concepts that are, have been widely talked about, you know, right trend, momentum, and so on. Uh, we've tested. I've got a giant database. We've done thousands of tests around different ways of calculating these things. We've chosen the ones that work the best together, um, uh, that we've found to work the best together. That changes a little bit as well from year to year in and year out. Um, we don't, but here's the good news. You don't even have to know what they are. The key thing I, I encourage everyone, if you, because I do encourage people to do your own form of ensemble forecasting, looking at different techniques that are lowly correlated or loosely correlated. So it doesn't really matter if you're using the best trend filter or the best momentum filter at all. What matters is are you using different uh, ways of analyzing the market and uh, different time frames is another way to do that as well. Um, Bryce, it might be helpful to show tracker trading strategies. Yeah, um, I can do that. Hold on one second, I think. Um, let me get first here. If you go on our website, I'm logged in, but even if you're not logged in, across our top nav bar, you can see, um, well, this is our alert page. I mentioned alerts. Uh, oh, I got stopped out uh, during the webinar. Lost $175. This is a tracking account uh, on the strategy. Uh, that particular strategy had a loser today. Here are the specifics that were shared with our clients, and it being a loser. Like I said, about two out of three work. These are different strategies here. Uh, different, um, they have goofy names, but uh, they're great strategies. And you can see any given day we have a nice visual in terms of the minimum and max entry levels. So these are alerts for different strategies. You can't see this part, but if you go to Tools and click on Strategies, you can see our tracker, and you can learn more about the individual strategies. Uh, these are the automated strategies. Um, we uh, another thing again. I don't want to make this commercial, but we do strictly control inventory. A lot of people say, "Well, why would you give away your stuff or sell your stuff if it's so good?" Well, I don't sell it to everybody. Uh, we've got capacity. Um, I can't use all the capacity, if you will, for our strategies, nor even our existing clients. So, um, and there are a lot of ways to use these strategies as well. So, we do strictly control inventory. Once they're sold out, we don't. They're off the shelf. Uh, but we're continually adding new strategies. And uh, in fact, this is going to be expanding a lot. Um, uh, so we've just been automating and rolling these things out over the past year or so. But you can study more, click on um, details, get an idea of how it's performed in a wide range of market conditions, um, different performance metrics, and uh, so on. Thank you, Brian. Yep, there you go, Brian. It's a public page. People are welcome to look at it.
Other questions? I don't see any new questions. Oh, just another version, sort of the same slide it looks like. Uh, yeah, so um, again, if, if you're just anxious to get started and want to dig in more, um, happy to answer your questions. Shoot me an email, scott at InvestorQuant. Um, otherwise, download the slides and we will um, send you invites to the two events I just mentioned on the 23rd of August, one for traders, one for investors that want to do auto trading, and I'll get into more details on exactly what our tools look like and how we do exactly what I just showed you. Well, sounds great. I really appreciate you coming on, Scott. It's uh, always nice to see how different traders uh, um, use their edges and make money in the market. Yeah. Oh, well, I appreciate the opportunity, Tom, and the interest, and I appreciate Brian. Um, here in uh, hooking us up. So I um, oh, appreciate the nice uh, words, Ian. Just a quick question. Are, are your uh, either of those webinars going to cover anything with sw uh, swing trading? I know a lot of option traders in our community are longer term orientation, you know, 30, 50, 60, 80 days out. And swing trading is probably appropriate for them to help their entries and exits. Um, are you going to cover any of that on these webinars? Um, you know what? Actually, we just did that webinar yesterday, uh, but what I can do is um, we recorded it and would be happy to send it. It was a public webinar. Um, Rob did a great oh, yeah. job. Uh, yeah, just send me the link and I'll post it with the recording for this one. Uh, we'll do that. If um, I'm not sure if Matt from my team is listening, but if um, – Yeah, he's, he's actually not, a presenter. <laughs> okay. He's a, he's not a panelist. That doesn't mean he's listening, though. He might be asleep by now. <laughs> That's true. He didn't call in. so <laughs> That's right. No, I'm teasing. I'm sure he's um, listening. What we'll do is we'll send you the link to the recording, and that would be helpful. Uh, Rob's tremendous. And again, our swing strategy is a real short-term oriented because we feel like there's plenty of people that help you find an edge for what's going to happen in the coming two weeks to two months. There are not many that are very good at – you know what's going to happen in the next from one day to five days, and that's really where Rob's expertise is. And we've taken Rob's been full-time trader, swing trading for 15 years, managing his own capital, actually managing others' capital as well. Um, so he's a real, he's literally a real professional, and um, he's helped create our tools at Investaquant that focus on uh, swing trading. So, and those those actually just another not to just giving people options. Those strategies, he's got a newsletter that's only $99 a month, so people that are more budget sensitive. And our edges, um, he's got a bundle offering. They're, I think, at $1,000 per year as well for swing trading. So a little less expensive than our intraday strategies. Um, that might be of interest to you folks. So we'll send that to you. Absolutely. Sometime. Yeah, thanks for Great. asking. All right. Well, uh, we're coming up on an hour, and uh, it's normally where we like to stop, so perfect timing. Uh, thanks, Scott. Great information. Really a nice presentation, as other people have said in the chat. Um, there is one last question. Carlos asked, how much is the minimum capital needed to, to trade your strategies? Now, we generally tell people you need at least twenty or 30000 If you don't have it, I think it just becomes really hard to justify, quite frankly, um, our fees with the returns you get. And you just lose some of your flexibility in terms of being able to trade more than one strategy and so on. So obviously, the more the better. Uh, most of our clients have, I'd say, 50000 or more in their accounts. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much. I'll get this recording posted as soon as I can and uh, get you copies of it. And hopefully we'll have you back in the future. And it's always uh, uh, nice to have you guys on. It's uh, great information. Thanks oh, again, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Brian. Thanks all for being here. Take care. All right. See you.